Now we're gonna get into some of those tests for testing the passive range of motion of your hip joint and your shoulder joints, but we're also gonna see the capabilities of it, okay? Um, in order to do that, what we'll get you to do is we're gonna analyze the anterior chain of the front part of your body first, so we'll get you to lie on your back first, okay? What I like to start off people with is the lower quadrant of the legs, so we'll get you to straighten out your legs. He's gonna lift his right leg up as high as he can. Okay, and we're gonna also test this component, right? So if we lift the leg up and it's real limited, so don't resist, pretend you were here, what does that mean? They're not getting a lot of clearance in their posterior chain and their hip joint. Okay, and you're okay, you get here, so that's good, okay? But what we're gonna do is hold it strong like you did. So hold it strong, and you're gonna tell me where you feel the muscle groups activating. Quads, right? Okay, anywhere else? Hip joint? My core. Core, and that's good. Not a lot of people are gonna get that though, right? So pay attention to that. So now we're gonna bring this leg out to the side. Don't resist the side position, just keep holding it up nice and strong, okay? I'm gonna push where I feel it, has it changed? More internal thigh now, okay? About the same, but a little different, okay? Good. Now we're gonna rest this completely in my hands, okay? This is a joint integrity test for the knee joint. If I was to put pressure at that lower position of the knee and there was laxity here, what would that tell us? There's a knee injury. Ligament or ligaments and connective tissues are loose. That means there's a huge risk involved with increasing intensity, running, changing direction, weights, blah, blah, blah. If you have that in your testing, then that's something you have to design with programming, okay? Again, being very thorough, okay? Now, relax this leg even more so. Now we're gonna look at the passive range of motion test, okay? So when my leg moves inside here, what am I testing? About which direction of the hip joint? External. Always think the origin of your body or the anatomy of your body whenever we're moving a limb or expressing comes from your midpoint, okay? So in this case, your hip joint, even though your leg moving in, is rotating externally. And what should be, yeah. So what should be the optimal angle for this? 90 degrees. So that would involve us having his heel flush with his groin area, okay? Is yours poor? No, because there'd be room for improvement, absolutely. You're getting about 60, 70 degrees. That's what the external bias will do. And this is with no pressure. Right. And you probably can't even cohesively do this or like intentionally do this. You should be able to just comfortably get there. So is there limitations? Absolutely. That's where that external bias becomes a problem. I don't recruit glute, hamstring, obliques. And you'll see it on the internal test too. So what do I overload in this position? Ankle joint, knee joint, quad, lower back. Okay? Because they have to overwork all the time. That's essentially how you're expressing your standing. And then you commit to more intensive movements with impact and intensity, right? Okay? So now let's look at that internal rotation. What should be the optimal angle for internal rotation? About 20 to 30 degrees, okay? And you're getting about 10 to 15. Is it jammed up? Absolutely, okay? Again, that's the external bias issue because you don't know how to recruit the proper oblique strength and actually the ankle and feet strength to articulate a transition. That's a fancy way of saying changing direction with power, with presence, with my whole body, okay? So, is there room for improvement? Absolutely. And we would never get that from hammering out a bunch of lunges and squats. It doesn't address that stuff. You have to take smaller intricate um, movement patterns and you need to free up the spacing here in the first place. I wouldn't want to hammer out a bunch of mobility drills or resistance drills with tissues that are chronically tight. So where do I start? The roll-ups, okay? That's why. So, now we've gone through the one leg here, let's look at the left leg a little quicker, okay? to lift the left leg, straight line, just for a second, like that, okay? So it may change, it may feel different, right? Where do you feel it? <laughs> yeah, okay, he just worked up, so yeah, that's part of it. Okay, we'll bring this leg up to the side, nice and strong, where do you feel it? Again. Okay, cool, relax the leg. Is this the knee injured, or is the leg one? Okay, cool. No laxity there, so he's okay.
lower quadrant, now we're going to look at the upper quadrant. So I'm going to get you to lift your right arm up like this. Okay, and this is the shoulder integrity test. You're going to create force, exertion, and four different angles, and you're going to tell me if you feel a bad pain. If it's muscle pain, it's muscle pain. If it's a bad pain, like something hurts, that's an impingement of some sort or an injury. Okay? So, push down towards your feet. Any pain? Up towards your head. Any pain? Out towards me. Any pain? In towards your chest. Any pain? Good. So there's a second portion to that. This is what we call limb. Okay? Limbs. One of the things that we mentioned in our consultation was the ability to articulate or initiate movement or expression of movement through your core. In this particular test, if I had a weaker or less of an active or intentionally stable core, when I go to create or express pushes, my body would react, right? Like if I was really weak in my core when I pushed up, my body would shift, my body would shift, my body would shift, and so forth, okay? When we pushed out, or we call that abduction, you had a little bit of that less stiffness or stability. Is that common? Absolutely. Unless you train that control mechanism or deceleration, that's going to be a bit of an issue because when you start, again, aggressively moving with weights and you know movement patterns, more risk is involved. Okay, so could you use some core strengthening? Probably. Okay, to stabilize everything. Okay, let's go through the left side now. Down towards your feet, any issues? Up towards your head, any issues? Up towards me, and then in towards your chest. Good. And on the left side, he was a little weaker. Right side was more proficient at staying stiff. Okay, left side, not your dominant side, less stiffness. Okay, is that common? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, one of the things I mentioned about 10 minutes ago was there's going to be three pertinent tests that have a little bit more weight in respect to importance. Okay. This is the first test that we're going to get to. So I need to stack the mat before I go any further. His anterior summary would go as such. He's dealing with some tight hips, okay? And I would say particularly more internal rotation issues, okay? because you're getting about 10 degrees when the optimal range for that hip rotation internally is about 30 degrees, okay? You were getting about 10 on each side. There were still some limitations on the external process, but less. So I would summarize it as more of an internal issue, but overall tight, okay? Yeah. And you wanna compare the two sides. So if that's hip mobility, your more dominant side has more rotation. So I would write it as greater, okay? Shoulder issues, no. Okay, shoulders were okay, there's no pain, right? Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, no pain, but there was a shift when we did abduction, and abduction is a fancy term for as you express movement outside of your midpoint for your torso, okay? Now, this time I'm gonna get you to lay flat on your stomach, and here's the thing. If you're gonna run a test like this, everything has to be aligned, and you'll never get that if you have somebody offset their head. So they gotta keep their head straight forward, and that's why I use the mat, okay? And you can rest your hands now beside your waist. Yeah. Now typically speaking, if I'm doing this at a gym, I'm not gonna have a chiropractor's bed or a massage parlor's bed with a face hole. And the reason why we stack mats, I should have probably grabbed another one, but that's okay, uh, is the ability to create some elevation off the ground, more so for the upper body test when we get there. So when you're doing this on your own, grab a few mats, explain this, okay, if you're going to use this test. This is a big test though, I know, okay? Alright, so, just like we started on the anterior chain, we're going to do the posterior chain. So I'm going to lift your right leg up as high as you can. Good. So when I go to push on this, tell me where you feel the muscle groups activating. My glutes. Glutes. Do you yes. feel it all in your hamstrings? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Okay, do you feel it all on the same side of the back or the uh, other side? Probably the same side. Okay, it's not bad. And do you feel anything at all in your obliques? No. Okay, do you feel your calf? If I could squeeze it. Yeah, do you feel your quad? Uh, no. Okay, good, take a quick break. All right, so we're gonna bring this leg out to the side, just like we did on the anterior chain, okay? Okay, you'll lift, not that much, just oh, straight. Okay. Yeah, same as we did on the anterior yeah. chain. Yeah, exactly, okay? 
I'm gonna put the pressure on there again where you feel it. My whole leg. Whole leg, you feel it more in your quad? I can see your quad firing off. Yeah, my calves. Hamstring? Yeah. Okay. Same side of the back or opposite side? Both sides. Okay, good. And then the obliques still quiet, okay? Side of your body there. They're activated. Okay, good, that's good. Okay. Now we're gonna bend that knee at 90 degrees. Like this? You had it right, but you're just gonna bend it from here. And then you're gonna lift it off the ground. Okay? Keeping it bent where you feel it now. More in the quad or less? Probably more. Probably less. That's good. Glutes and hamstrings more? Yeah. Good. Same side of the lower back or opposite side? Same side. Okay, and then obliques? Activated. Okay, very good. Okay. Alright, so in your case, you're very rare. One of the consistent muscle groups I asked for, almost in the same order, was the glutes, uh -huh. the hamstrings, the opposing side of the back, and the obliques. The extras, which we didn't want, were the calves and the quads and the same side of the back. Why is this important? I'm gonna explain. So, we created some type of intentional force on the posterior chain. When you lifted the leg, we wanted to see how much strength and endurance it had to keep in that same profile, okay? That particular muscle relationship is super important when we need to express movement with intent. That's a fancy way of me saying, if we're not walking, we're running, okay? Now, if these muscle groups are endured and aren't firing off, which is what happens to most people, they actually don't have the same activation you would, their running pattern is probably off a bit. And it might be due to some other stuff which we're gonna test in a little bit, but essentially what they'll do is they don't create the proper initiation and driving force to propel their posterior chain. Should your posterior chain be stronger than your front part? Absolutely, okay? You should have a big set of glutes and hamstrings and strong obliques and yada, yada, yada. What happens with people is it becomes a very serious imbalance, okay? Quads take over, calves take over, same side of the back take over, and then their glutes and hamstrings don't really fire off, okay? You're ahead of the curve. Most people aren't gonna be like that, okay? And they'll produce their gait pattern with very sloppy technique. They'll more or less do this, okay? They're all over the place. And why is that a problem? Because what they're doing is when they're running, they're chopping the ground instead of floating, okay? And they can't create that proper initiation force or cohesive activation, okay? Again, you're ahead of the curve. Now, with that being said, we put the same amount of pressure on his anterior chain as opposed to the posterior chain. When I put the pressure there, did it start to fail? Yeah, it did, it wasn't as strong. So could there be room for growth there? Or should we focus more on that? Absolutely, okay? Now, typically speaking, after somebody has done this test and they score in a certain way, which could be very poor, a lot of the times it's because it's too tight from some of the stuff we discussed 10 minutes ago, from patterns, imbalances, blah, 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 okay? And the only way to really test that is to get quite personal with them, okay? Because you wanna see to what extent they're dealing with the tightness. So what I would do is go ahead and relax. I'm gonna put pressure in some of these areas. If there's pain, that tells me I need to spend more time releasing it first. Because there's no point in hammering it down with resistance if it's tight all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna take it to its limit and you could tear something or hurt something, okay? So, I put pressure there, does that hurt? No. no. Okay, he's rare again. Put pressure anywhere in there, does that hurt? Okay, anywhere here. Does it tickle? Good, okay, anything in here? And then finally into the hip joint, does it tickle? No. Okay, okay, again, he's rare, but a lot of the times when you go to do tests, the people are gonna either laugh or it's gonna hurt. Mm -hmm. So they would spend more time rolling out. Mm -hmm. And then they'd go into drills to address some of these limitations, create length and strength in these areas, because they're chronically collapsed from sitting, from being in balance, okay? So, you tested differently though. You didn't have a lot of pain, so would you spend as much time rolling out these tissues? Probably not. I would say probably yeah, just so I can not get injured. Right, you, but the thing is, you could transition now quicker into mobility drills and activation drills than the person who's chronically tight, okay? Yeah, and you base it upon what that person's dealing with, okay? You don't base it upon your theory and you creating a program without doing this stuff. That's what this is all about, okay? All right, so now that we've addressed this, let's go to the left side a little faster, okay? okay? Oh, we don't even have to just go there. Pardon me? We don't even have to, yeah. 
No, no, I should, because this is your testing. I mean, uh, I'm treating this as if you're going to be my client, right? So go ahead and lift your left leg. Where do I feel it? Okay. Where else? Both well, sides of my Both sides, okay. Not really in your hamstring on this side. I can feel my hamstring. Yeah. I, I can't feel my quad or my calf. That's a good thing. Yeah. Always scoring well. Okay, take a break. So actually a little stronger too. Bring the left leg out to the side. Yeah, good. Where do I feel it now? My glute, hamstring, um, both sides of my back. Okay. My Bend the knee at 90 degrees. Go ahead. And typically speaking, what you'll see for people when they do this one is their quad will take over. And that's the inability to control that pelvis position. They'll arch their lower back too far, and that's where that ugly gait pattern comes from. Good, take a break. Okay, I'll spare him the touch test, but that's what we do to follow up, okay? Now again, I mentioned about five minutes ago, we had to create some height off the ground to do these particular tests for the upper body, okay? Because if you're flat on the ground and you actually lose the ability to really look at this, okay? So, depending on people's height, you would stack the weights. Like if a guy's really tall, three, four height. Three, four, you know, max. Somebody shorter, two max, that's good. Okay, all right, three tests now for the upper body. The first one you're gonna do, I just want you to look at lifting your arms up over your head. Nothing else, if anything, you're putting your weight, including your head and your pelvis, into the ground and just try to lift your arms over your head, okay? And this has to be an average, so we do about three reps. Okay, go for it. Good, take a quick break, two more. What we're looking for when we're doing this is how much height he's typically getting. And when he lifts, does he have to cheat a bit or is there compensation where he flares out? For him, he's doing really well. He actually has a lot of mobility there, okay? Good, we'll place our hands now at, at a T position. Okay, T position literally at the shoulder joints. Now it's imperative that when I'm doing this particular test, I want people to just use the upper components of their shoulder blades and their back, not their lats. If they were using their lats, their arms would sink into their armpits. Now they're bigger muscle group. Typically what most people can use, not the smaller ones. So I want him to lift flush from this position. In order to do that, we're gonna turn the thumbs toward the ceiling. So go ahead and lift, and when you lift, dash straight up. Don't sink into your armpits, good. Two more. And we're testing his ability to build retractable strength or literally pull a lot of intentional rowing and pulling patterns or recruitment of strength through his posterior chain. Last one. And again, he does well. A lot of times this isn't gonna happen for people. Good. Now we're gonna place our hands at our waist. This is probably the most important one, the same one you did for your leg, yeah. Um, this is gonna test the traps. Now, for most people, because of their imbalances, and what society suggests is you need big upper traps, right? People do shrugs and stuff like that. The issue with that is, it not, does it not lead into some of those imbalances? Absolutely, okay? And what you actually need is the ability to use and retract the trapezius muscle, because they insert here, this is where it starts, okay? And that's why it's called the trapezius muscle. With the inability to rope, rotator and retract that, you're gonna be so forward flex that when you go to create resisting forces like a deadlift or a squat, your pattern or your posture of control is gonna change. And then people typically add more resisting forces in there. Does that not increase the, the risk for injury? Absolutely. You're also gonna bleed power or tension, okay? And hurt your shoulders, hurt your neck, you name it. So what we're gonna do here is look at the ability to pull those shoulder blades back, okay? If you move well for somebody, their arms will naturally lift off the ground. They also won't shift. Okay, so I don't want any type of crazy shift. I just simply should be able to just pull them back. Okay, so let's do three reps here. Good, okay, two more. And what we're looking for again with this test is how far is he able to get it off? You should comfortably get it way off, right? They shouldn't be necessarily dragging on the mat whatsoever, and he moves well. What are you typically gonna see? Restrictions, okay? If somebody has restrictions, where would they start their programming again or their initial work to get ready for their workouts? Rollouts again, because they're chronically tight. Yeah. Putting them through a mobility screen or movement screens when they come in with these problems isn't gonna create the actual space they need. It's just gonna keep jamming up. 
so they would need time to roll out first. Okay, because again, you get a warm up from coming in off the street, changing your clothes, walking to the area you're gonna work out with. So there's no point in like getting your blood flowing or getting your body moving in those same stiff patterns. Sure, you're gonna get blood flow, but you're not actually addressing the problem, okay? Now, if we were to analyze his posterior summary, he's scoring very well. He gets a lot of the proper recruitment, I call it a muscle relationship, particularly the glute, the hamstring, the obliques, and the opposing side of the back are working when we create exertion or intentional force, okay? A lot of times you're not gonna see that. And with the upper body, there really isn't limitations for you. You're getting full movement. And one of the things I mentioned about 20 minutes ago was, Sometimes posture will tell us a story, but not always. And that's why we combine it with this type of stuff. Because you set up that, but you're able to move properly so far. Okay, so that's why you use all these tests together. Okay, cool. We'll end this one and then we'll go into their next few.